Lord, thanks so much for meeting us here. Thanks so much for providing the opportunity for us to give our hearts and our lives to you. Without you, we would be nothing. But with you, we can do all things. When you come into our lives, Lord, you have an impact. You, you change us. And we're so thankful for that. And I pray, Lord, for that, that remodeling, that change to happen in our hearts this morning as we delve into your word. Make us more aware of your presence in our lives and more aware of your spirit working through us and in us so that we can represent you in this dying world so that you can bring your life to a place that needs it so very much. And we thank you, Lord, for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Honor. Honor. The Webster's Dictionary defines honor as the reputation, self-perception, or moral identity of an individual or a group. And Webster says that basically honor has three parts to it. Reputation, recognition, and privilege. Honor... Basically, these three parts of it, reputation is the, the opinion that other people have of you. Recognition is what they say about you because of that opinion. And privilege is what you get to do because they think so highly of you. Now, honor itself is not a bad thing. Except when it's not deserved. Or when the effect of honor becomes serving of yourself rather than serving the Lord. Andrew Carnegie once said of honor, all honor's wounds are self-inflicted. We as humans, unfortunately, because we live in this fallen world, have a tendency to use honor incorrectly, and yet it's such a beautiful, wonderful thing that we can give and see lives tremendously changed because of that honor. And in Luke 14, Jesus really teaches us about this trap that honor has on our lives as humans when we focus on ourselves, when honor is self-inflicted. But also he points out that through humbleness, we can experience true honor. So let's look at Luke 14, starting in verse 1. And I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. If you do need a Bible, by the way, we have some over here uh, to my left. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, so this wasn't just your ordinary average garden variety Pharisee, a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy, And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. So the Pharisees, as we have seen several times in our journey through Luke's gospel, continually lay traps for the Lord Jesus. And this is a very important dinner. We have a ruler of the Pharisees who's here, and they're watching Jesus very carefully to see if he violates any portion of the law, because they could use that to discredit him. Jesus was very popular. The people were really behind him, even though they didn't really understand what he was really all about. The people were looking for political freedom from Rome and a political ruler in Jerusalem. Jesus Christ came to be a Messiah that gave them freedom from sin first. And then later he would come back to be the ruler and the king, not just of Jerusalem, not just of the Roman Empire, but of the whole world. And the Pharisees were dead set against that. Because Jesus threatened the power that they held over the people. They basically wanted two things. A position for themselves and rules to help keep them in positions of authority. And honor being accorded to the Pharisees was very important to them. 
And so here comes Jesus, who doesn't act like a Pharisee, he doesn't talk like a Pharisee, and what he's doing is directly threatening to keep them in their position of authority. So here's Jesus at this dinner party, and here's this guy before him who has what the ESV version calls dropsy. Does anybody else have a different word there in their Bible? Dropsy? Okay. And this guy was likely a plant. In other words, the Pharisees weren't just saying, oh, how fortunate for us. Here's a man who needs to be healed, and oh, it happens to be the Sabbath. Let's see what Jesus does. No, no. They were much more crafty than that. It's quite likely that the Pharisees had this guy who they knew needed to be healed come to this important dinner party where they knew Jesus was because they were setting him up with a trap. Because they knew that Jesus was so compassionate about people he just couldn't help when he saw somebody who needed healing reaching out his, his, his power from God to heal that person. How jaded the Pharisees were that they would use this person who was suffering. They didn't care a whit about him. All they wanted to do was to try and trip Jesus up. So Jesus comes and dropsy, by the way, is probably or, or possibly the same thing that we would, we would call uh, an edema which is where fluids build up in the body, in the, the bodily tissues and cavities, and it's possibly caused by a, a heart problem, a weak heart that couldn't pump properly, and so then uh, in the other systems of the body, then these fluids would, would build up. Now, in, it in and of itself was not life-threatening, but it was a very serious condition. So why is that important? Here's why. The Pharisee's trap was this. On the Sabbath day, you were to rest, right? The Lord made the Sabbath in order for man to rest. Well, the Pharisees had taken that, and they had said, okay, you're not supposed to do any regular work. What are all the different kinds of regular work that we have? Well, we have all these different professions that people do, one of which is the profession of being a doctor. So if you heal on the Sabbath, you're doing the work of a doctor, and because you're not supposed to work then, voila, you can't heal on the Sabbath. That's how they came up with that rule. <clears throat> However, they had a, uh, uh, an out for that rule, and that was if the condition of the person was life-threatening, then you could perform the duties of a doctor on the Sabbath. So, you know, it's kind of this weird sort of way that they had twisted the Sabbath around uh, to suit their own needs and to escape from looking bad in front of the people. But so, Jesus comes and um, he realized, just as everyone realized, that if you were to question these rules that the Pharisees had given and made up, and say, this is ridiculous, here's, this man is obviously suffering, and here's the power to heal, how come we can't just say, see this man healed? If you were to question the authority and the honor of the Pharisees, why they could just turn and say, you're excommunicated. You will have no fellowship. You can't come to synagogue. Your family will disown you. You will be a beggar on the streets. That's the kind of power that these men held over people. So people were completely cowed by them and totally afraid of coming against them. So Jesus comes, and here's this guy, and first he says, well, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Let's just get this settled once and for all. But notice that they remained silent. They weren't really at this point interested in a, in a true discussion about the law with Jesus. They just wanted to see if they could catch him. So they thought, all right, let's be quiet. Let's not engage him because I know whenever we engage this guy in conversation, we always lose. So let's just stay quiet and see what he does. So Jesus, it says in verse 4, he took him and healed him and sent him away. He said, all right, You've got this problem. Be healed. And the guy, you know, instantly is healed. And he says, okay, you can go now. You were just a pawn in these guys' hands, but I have compassion on you. I've touched you, and, and now you can go. You don't have to be a part of this. And so off he goes. And so then look what Jesus does. He says, which of you having a son or an ox, uh, that son word there can, in some manuscripts, is also translated donkey. So you have a son or an ox that's fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out. See, there was another one of those little loopholes that they had to the Sabbath law, and that is, if one of their animals that provided income for them fell into a well or into a pit, 
they weren't going to die, but, you know, imagine the donkey or whatever walking around in the pit all night was just, you know, really bad, and they, you know, i got to work this animal come Monday morning or come Sunday morning, so I better get it up out of there. So the Pharisees said, okay, if, if you know, if, if uh, an ox or a donkey falls into a pit, you can pull that out on the Sabbath. That's okay. That's not working. That's not doing the work of a farmer. So you can do that. And that so Jesus is pointing out to them the hypocrisy of their own rules. That for a non-life-threatening situation that involves something that can bring them profit, well, okay, we can, we can do that on the Sabbath. But here's this guy who's suffering. It's not life-threatening, but suffering nonetheless. So it's silly to allow this over here and to forbid this over here. And of course, verse 6, And they could not reply to these things. Because they realized Jesus had them once again. Jesus, you see, doesn't need rules. Why? Because Jesus has the heart of God. Jesus, the, the law, you see, is, is merely a way to point us to the fact that we don't have the heart of God as humans on our own. But Jesus did. Jesus was fully man and fully God. But for us, we love lists. That's why the Pharisees' deal was so successful. We want lists. Okay, these are on the in list. And if you do these over here, you're on the out list. So you just do all the things on the in list and don't do any on the out list and you're made in the shade. No problem. You can please God because you're just following this list of rules. And Jesus is saying, no, I want you to have my heart. I want you to have my mind. I want you to think like me. I want you to act like me. There's a character that I have that is filled with love and compassion. Your silly rules are standing in the way of the greater good, and that is that I am love. And I love how the Apostle Paul put it a little bit later on. Paul, of course, at this time, as you know, was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And we don't know, but it's possible that the Apostle Paul, as a young man, of course, Saul of Tarsus at this time, might not have been at some of these gatherings, watching Jesus Christ, siding with the Pharisees, until later on when the Lord arrested him on the road, turned him around, showed him what he had really done. And then he gave his heart to the Lord. He became born again. And then he wrote these words, All things are lawful for me. Wow. Now, for a Pharisee to write those words would be really something incredible. All things are lawful for me. All things. He didn't say all things except for this list over here. All things are lawful for me. But then he goes on. This is in 1 Corinthians 10, by the way. He says, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. See, the Lord is about changing lives, healing lives, bringing people into his kingdom, seeing them turned and changed, not chained down by laws and rules made up by men. And I love how he finishes the thought in uh, chapter 10 of his letter to the Corinthians, verse 24. He says, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. That's beautiful, especially how then it works into this next section. So in verse 7, they're still at the, at the party, right? And, and the Pharisees are a bit off balance now. They're going, okay, round one to Jesus. <laughs> now he told a parable to those who were invited. When he noticed how they chose the places of honor. So I'll describe this to you before I read it. Basically, what they would do is um, they sat around a table shaped like a U, okay? And at these parties, they didn't, they didn't sit in chairs. You know the whole Last Supper thing, uh, sitting at the table on chairs and all that? Just get that out of your mind. They didn't do that. That was sort of uh, the artist's rendering of something that never happened that way. They would sit on the ground, and lean on pillows with a very low table. And it was shaped like a U. And the place of highest honor at those banquets would have been the person in the apex of the U. And then 
it descended down this way in terms of lesser and lesser honor so that the, the person who was the bottom of the totem pole in that particular gathering would sit closest to the ends of the U. And so Jesus notices how these guys come in and they're jockeying for position. And they're, they're walking in and they're looking up, okay, Rabbi Lemuel is over here. He's got a little bit more honor than me, but I have more honor than Rabbi Joshua over here, so I'm going to sit between Rabbi Lemuel and Joshua because I think I can get as close to the person who's the ruler of the Pharisees as possible. And that's what they were trying to do. They were doing this whole jockeying. It's kind of almost like musical pillows, if you will. Somebody, and and the, 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 the risk that you had was you needed to get there early enough to put yourself closest to the honored person, but not late enough so that you would end up having to sit on the fringes because all of the honored positions were taken. So you could see him coming in and they're about to sit down and, you know, not quite sure. And, oh, there's somebody else comes in with more honor. Okay, I'll go down one seat. So they're all trying to jockey themselves into position. So Jesus notices this, okay? He's a great student of human behavior, and he says, When you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him, and he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, So that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I love how Jesus uses ordinary, uh, everyday activities and events to teach. Have you ever noticed how he does that? Here they're just sitting at the table, and he he teaches them about the difference between self-serving honor and humbleness and about exalting yourself. And he comes up with these great pictures. I just love how he does that. And you know what? We can do that too. We don't necessarily have to go out with our our PhD in exegetical theology and we, we, uh, you know, we lay out this big philosophical construct that is just completely uh, sound. There's no way that anybody can, can break our logic and no way that anyone can understand our logic. You know, let's say you're out, you're out snow skiing on the slopes. You know, here's it's fall. It's coming up. Snow's going to start flying soon. And you're out there on the ski slopes and, and you're just chatting with the person that's going up on the chairlift with you. And you could remark to that person, as snowflakes are falling on your goggles, you can say, did you know that every single snowflake is completely different? There is no two, there are no two snowflakes that are alike. Isn't that amazing? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought of how often God has to sit down at his computer and draw a new snowflake? (laughs) Right, Deanna? It would drive designers crazy, wouldn't it? God's amazing, isn't he? And you know, he's made each one of us unique too. And yet he knows every one of us. He knows the hairs on our head. They're all counted. Isn't that an incredible God? You know, it's just what's around you. Um, You're in the grocery store and you're looking through your your coupon envelope trying to, you know, get the best deal on something and, and there's another person that's doing that by you and maybe it's a person that you know and you're, you're, sh- you're sharing coupon stories and you can say, you know, I, I got a great deal the other day on kumquats, but God gave me the best deal I've ever found on anything and that was eternal life for free. You know, there are, just, there are ways that we can just use whatever is around us. You know, God said to Moses when he appeared before him at the burning bush, what's in your hand? And Moses had a stick, just an ordinary stick. And God said, I can use that. And he can use everything that we have and just who we are and where we are and the situations that we're in to bring about his truth. But so here he is doing this with, these, um, with the men at this banquet. And the spiritual truth that he brings out is actually quite true for us as humans as well. And we like to think that we really are to be accorded honor with our technology and our science and, and our athletic prowess or our philosophies that we've come up with. And, and we like to think of ourselves as, the, as able to sit pretty high. You know, we're pretty special. It's until we see the person who is truly 
at the honored position that we realize how low we really are. And that's God in his, in his purity. And we realize that we've just reached too far. But if instead of trying to see how high we can go without somebody having to tell us to sit lower, if instead we go to the lowest place and we say, Lord, I don't deserve your love. I don't deserve for you to even invite me to be here with you. And then from that place of humbleness, realizing that we shouldn't even be in God's presence. But then we just, we hear God reaching out to us, even as the person here in in Jesus' parable, he says, sit at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. And that's what God does to us. Us who deserve nothing. We don't deserve to even come to the banquet. And and God comes to us and he says, I can cleanse you and make you so that you can be with me. And not only do we get a place of honor because of what the Lord has done, but he says, come on up here and sit next to me. And we'll have dinner together and we'll just talk and we'll have a great time. But if we instead place ourselves in a place of pride... And say, you know, I'm pretty special. God's lucky to have me. We may find ourselves taken down a few notches. Sometimes I think that we Christians make that mistake when we, we start thinking, you know, I'm pretty special to the body of Christ, and I don't know what the church would do if I wasn't around. It'd fall to pieces. And it's just simply not true. Somebody gave me a really hard picture of this one time, and I just I had a difficult time with this for the longest time. And they said, basically, your part in the ministry is like someone sticking their finger in a bucket of water. That's the kind of, you know, indentation you make and the kind of place that you have. And if you were to pull your finger out of the water, how long would it take for the water to return back to the way it was before? You see, we, in our of ourselves don't have anything. Everything that we have to offer is what the Lord is doing through us. And yet somehow he allows us, he asks us, he wants us to give our lives to him so that he can work through us. And I think that's really, really cool. So this spiritual picture of God wanting to invite people to a banquet continues. Jesus tells them another story. Look at this in verse 12. He said, also to the man who had invited him, So remember, this is to the ruler of the Pharisees, okay? He says, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. See, there is the taking of honor as we, as people, try to sit up closest to the host as we can, so we'll be accorded the most honor, the best reputation, the best privilege. But there's also the giving of honor where people will say, you know, do you remember in, maybe they don't still do this in today's, PC school environment, but in, when I went to elementary school and we had physical education, they would go out and we would be playing like um, softball or, or uh, flag football or something like that, and they would line everybody up and they would pick the two jocks in the group and they would have them stand over there and they'd go, okay, pick teams. Didn't you just love that? <sighs> what was the worst possible thing that could happen? Yeah, picked last. That was awful. I don't remember if I was ever picked last or not. I think I've selectively removed that memory from my brain. (laughs) But see, that's the giving of honor. And so the person who's the captain gets to give honor to people in descending order. I want you on my team best, and then your second best. And and then what the awful thing was, at the very end, the two captains would fight. And they'd say, I don't want that person on my team. Can't you take him? And this poor soul is just crushed standing there on the Man, I, maybe I did get picked last. I... <laughs> so Jesus says to this guy... Don't be giving honor to those who then can give honor back to you. And it becomes this kind of give and take, back and forth, tit for tat. 
what you really need to do is give to people who cannot give to you in return. Why? Because again, that's the heart of God. The rules would say the person who can give the most honor is the most honored, but God says you give to somebody who doesn't deserve it because that's who I am. I am God is the most pure, incredible. He's the only be, the only being in the universe that is self-sufficient. He doesn't need anything. And yet he also gives everything. His love is selfless. He doesn't need us, and yet he gives love to us. That's what he's getting at here. Give to those who don't deserve to get anything because I gave to you who don't deserve to get anything. And so then he goes on, he talks more in depth about his own invitation to his own banquet. And he uses this parable. He says, when one of those who reclined at table with him, verse 15, heard these things, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat in the kingdom of God. So the guy raises the subject. Ah, yes, the kingdom of God. But he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Verse 21. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. And the master of the house became angry. And he said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done. And there is still room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. So what's going on here? There are actually several levels of things happening. And on one level, this is a direct blast to the Pharisees. Because, you see, the servant represents the prophets and Jesus himself, the greatest of the prophets, who came to deliver the message. Come to my banquet. Leave everything behind that you called precious and come and be with me. And yet they would not listen. They said, well, you know, I just did a real estate deal and that's more important to me than coming to be with you. Excuse me. I reject your invitation. Another guy said... I just bought some. Uh, I just bought a new car, and I've got to go check it out. I got to make sure that it's going to run good for me because I made a real steal of a deal here. And frankly, this car is more important to me than coming to your banquet. I refuse. Another guy said, "I've just cr had a new relationship here on Earth, and that relationship is more important to me than the relationship I have with you. I refuse your invitation." Just as the the children of Israel. God's chosen people, when Jesus Christ came and he said, here's the invitation from the Father. I am the one whom the Father has sent to invite you to banquet with him. And the Pharisees and the people said, no. What we've got is more important than what you are wanting to give to us. So we reject your invitation. But I also want you to see something else. I want you to see the heart of the Father. Some people will say, you know, Christianity, kind of a narrow thing, isn't it? You guys just have your own little club, and God is just really trying to only let a few people in, only those that subscribe to this set of regulations over here, this people that will walk and talk and dress this way. God's really not about letting people in. He's about keeping as many people out as possible. I don't think that's true. I think this section, this little parable here, reveals the, the, the heart of God. The heart of God that will say, go out to the highways and compel people to come in, for I tell you, I want my house to be filled. God wants everyone to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. The Bible says that God takes pleasure in the death of no man. 
God wants everyone to come, but they must come by accepting God's invitation. The book of the Revelation says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He who opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Jesus Christ stands at the door of all of our hearts and he's knocking. Will we open the door to him or will we say, you know, I've got my deal going here and I just don't have time to be dealing with the fact that the Bible tells me that I'm evil and that I need to turn and have my life cleansed by Jesus Christ? No, I don't feel evil. I, in fact, I feel pretty good about myself. I don't know Jesus. Thanks, but no thanks. Can't you see the sign? No solicitation. But the heart of the Father is to bring everyone that will receive Jesus Christ to dine with him. And he wants us to be that same way. To consider it an incredible honor to be invited to dine with the Lord of the universe. Verse 25. So we've left the banquet, and great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you Desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, The man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he's able, with 10,000, to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Wow, pretty pretty hard words. And this is actually the section of scripture that we're going to go in depth on on Wednesday night when we talk about the true cost and the true benefits of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. So um, come out Wednesday and we'll go over that um, more in depth. But I do want to point out, um, I do want to point out at least one thing, you know, where Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and doesn't hate his own father and mother, does that mean that Jesus is saying that when you come to him, you need to turn around to your father and mother and say, I hate you? <laughs> do you think? No, <laughs> no, no, of course not. I think what Jesus is really saying is, is what's, what is the most precious thing to you? Again, remember from the, the invitation, the, the property and, and, the, and the new yoke of oxen and the relationship were more important to these people than, 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 than uh, accepting the invitation of the king. And if we uh, consider our relationships with our father and mother and our brother and sister with our property, with the things that we're doing here on earth as more important than coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, don't even bother coming. You have to be willing to lay it all down. And in the face of your love and devotion for Jesus Christ, your love for everything else should appear as if it were hate. I think that's really what, what he's saying. But what he's talking about here is coming to a place of humbleness. A place of humbleness where we realize that we're at the low end of the table, that we don't deserve to be invited to the banquet at all, but that in fact we are those who love him and pick up our cross and come after him. The cross representing death. We die to ourselves so that we can live for him. And when we do that, we have the presence of his spirit in our lives that's actually affecting that change in us. But it's a change that is not just on the inside only. It's a change that actually works itself out in the way that we act with other people. And that's how he finishes up the chapter. He says, salt is good, verse 34. But if salt has lost its taste... How shall its saltiness be restored? It's of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has an ear, 
He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, salt in those days, uh, believe it or not, the Morton Salt Company did not exist in Jesus' day. They got their salt from the marshes around the Dead Sea, and that's because the Dead Sea goes by another name. That's the Salt Sea. The Dead Sea has no natural outlet at this time. And the Jordan River runs down north-south, down through the uh, land of Israel, and it ends up flowing, you know, out of the Sea of Galilee and down the Jordan and then into the Dead Sea, and that's where it stops. And so over the years, the salts that have leached out of the soil and and from the um, biological matter that's died and fallen into the river and gotten washed down, it collects in the Dead Sea. And so it, it because there's no natural outlet, the water has become briny, and it's much more salty than the ocean. And if you've ever swum in the Dead Sea, it's kind of hard to swim, actually. You just kind of float. And you go out there, and, and, and you just kind of bob way up high in the water. And, and you, if you tried to swim down into it, it would be really hard because the saltiness of the water makes you very buoyant. And so afterwards, actually, after you've, you have um, swum, they make you take a shower because otherwise you'd just be covered in this gross kind of salt stuff. So anyway, uh, the marshes, back to my point here, the marshes around the Dead Sea is where they got the salt. But it was impure, and it would deteriorate rapidly. And if that happened, this kind of salt, you couldn't just recycle it, you couldn't uh, do anything with it. There was no other use for it at all except to simply throw it away. Now, salt is used for two things. It's used as a preservative, and it's used as a flavoring agent. And here's, I think, what Jesus was talking about. It's what a life in Christ should be. We flavor the world with Jesus Christ. Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 in terms of a fragrance, You have a taste, you have a fragrance as a Christian, living your life outwardly for Jesus Christ. Basically, you should taste salty or Christy or something like that to the people that are around you. And the question is, do you? If someone, if 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 I stopped one of your your close friends on the street and I said, Did you did you know that this person over here was a believer in Jesus Christ? And they'd say, No, you're kidding me. I would never have guessed that in a million. No, you're just fooling me. Couldn't be. You know. Do you live your life in Christ on the outside or is it something that you just hide on the inside? When people see us, they should see salt. Not that we are all salt in the sense that they we're never a real person to them, but the only things that we will say is to spout Bible verses. You know, you can't have a relationship with somebody like that. We are real people, and God works through real people. But there should be a flavoring throughout your life and throughout the things that you do and say about the Lord Jesus Christ. We should be transparent believers, is another way to say it. So that when people look at our lives closely, they will also see the presence of of Jesus Christ in us. So we are a flavoring agent to the world. We are also a preservative. It's true that the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives that's working outwardly through us does have an effect on the world around us because we are real people and we vote and we have opinions and we have an influence in our world around us through our relationships and the things that we do and we say. And there is something to the presence of Christians in the world kind of keeping it from going to hell in a handbasket. And there's going to come a time when the Lord will say, okay, it's time for me to retrieve my salt. And he's going to take us out of this world. And then what will happen? The world will go to to hell in a handbasket quite quickly because that preserving agent will be taken out of the world. So if you don't live your life for Jesus... Let his righteousness both inform and form your reality, then you become less useful to the Lord. Now, I don't think Jesus is saying, yeah, if you're not, you know, on fire for me, I'm going to just toss you to the side and get rid of you. Ah, what good are you? No, I don't think that's what he's saying at all. But I think that what we have here is him saying, you won't be of use to the Father. And to me, that's what I want. That's what I desire. I desire to be a useful agent 
in the hands of the Lord. Um, I think it's the Apostle Peter, who I'm not sure about that, but who talks about being um, vessels that are are useful for honorable things or those that are for more common use. And there's, there's a strain of thought that suggests that what God is talking about is that those who have really given their lives and let the Holy Spirit work out through them and are a willing participant in this change that happens in a life, they become more useful to the Lord. But those who just are saved, they got their fire insurance policy, and they know they're going to heaven, but they aren't really interested in living a life for Christ... They are still going to be with him, but they're not of any use. Nobody's going to come to salvation through them because they're not telling anybody about it. No, no person's going to see their life and go, you know, I want what you have. What is it that you have? Because they're not interested in letting the Lord change them. So we should be salt. We should be a flavoring agent and we should be a preserving agent in the Lord. So just in conclusion, you know... Being salt isn't all that exciting. If I had to pick a food group, (laughs) I think I'd be chocolate. (laughs) Yay. Or maybe a T-bone steak. Ooh, man, that'd be great. I think sometimes, you know, we want to be the flamboyant food on God's Food Network TV show. We want to be the thing where God goes, you know, bam! But salt, you know, it's just this little whitish kind of crystal thing that you pass around the table with the pepper. You know, it doesn't even stand on its own. It's always, can you pass the salt and pepper? You know, why can't you just say, pass the salt occasionally? I need some recognition here, people. You know, we're, we're just salt. You know, it's not really important and flashy and flamboyant. But imagine your dinner with no salt at all. You see, salt is not the centerpiece but it provides the flavor for the meal. You might not be the most flamboyant Christian. People might not look at the the, the ministry that's set before them here of your life and say, look at, I want that T-bone steak. That is really something special. This person is really incredible. But they eat what the Lord has set before them, and it tastes great. Why? Because it's been salted. You have just been that, those little white crystals that disappear in the food. But because you live your life for the Lord and the Holy Spirit is working through you, you, you may not be doing anything that anybody ever notices. But God uses your life to flavor the body of Christ and make an incredible meal out of something that would just be really bland. So, you know what? It's okay to be salt. It's okay. Let's pray. Father... Thanks for making us salt. And we pray, Lord, that we would be usable salt. Use us, Lord, to bring about the flavor of you in this world as we walk about, as we talk, as we act, as we live, and even as we suffer, Lord. May what, may what people experience in us be that incredible flavoring agent that is you. Not that we're proud and arrogant, Lord. Not that we're demanding to take honor for ourselves or give honor to those who we think can get us more. But instead, Lord, make us like you who would invite the lowly, those that don't deserve honor. We thank you, Lord, so much for your love. And just right now, as all eyes are closed and heads are bowed, If you're in this place this morning or you're listening to the sound of my voice and and you realize that maybe you have tried to take the place of honor in your own life and you have left God out, but that indeed you don't deserve God's love, but you want it, I would encourage you to accept his invitation. He wants everyone to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So this morning, if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, he died on the cross voluntarily for you in order to cleanse the evil in you, and you want him to be your Lord, you want him to be your king, you want to come to his banquet and be with him and live with him forever, he's knocking at the door of your heart. If today you want to open that door, I would just encourage you just to to, um, raise your hand. Nobody's looking around. 
and receive him this morning. And if you're in a place other than with us here on Sunday morning, you just bow your heart before God and just pray this prayer along with me. Lord God, I realize that I am evil and I have done things and said things and thought things that aren't pure. And I don't deserve to be in your presence. I don't deserve to be invited to your banquet. And yet, Lord, you have extended an invitation to me through your son, Jesus Christ. I acknowledge that he died on a cross for my sins. And I take up that cross and I renounce everything in my life in favor of accepting his invitation to be my Savior and be my Lord. And I give my heart to him because I want to be at his banquet table with that joy and love and peace for all of eternity. Thank you for doing that, Lord. You are my Lord now. You are my King. If you can pray that prayer, then welcome to the family. Welcome to God's banquet table. You will be with him forever. And Father, I pray that you would come and start that banquet soon. We want to be with you where you are. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.